love to just welcome you tonight to join us in Citizens Climate University, a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities relating to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and I wanna thank you especially for joining us tonight because chances are you're probably gonna be a lobby lead in maybe even the next month. And so in this lesson, we're gonna make sure that we go into detail on that special role for you as leading the meetings and to make sure that you feel set up to go to prepare to meet with a plan and also help everyone on your team know how to work together to ensure a successful meeting. So to help get us there, we have a resident expert, one of the guys that's probably been to more actual conferences than anyone else I know. Don Adu is a native of North Carolina, graduate of Appalachian State University. He has a degree in ecology and environmental biology. He spent the last decade advocating for renewable energy and action on climate change and founded CCL's first group in North Carolina back in 2011. He's currently the Southeast Director for CCL and manages over 40 groups spanning across the Carolinas, Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. And his primary focus is going to be on Spotlight tonight, helping us leverage our grassroots organizing towards lobbying with direct congressional federal support. So with that, just a quick overview for those of you that are curious about some of the other trainings that might be upcoming. We are doing this one tonight specifically for lobby leads. Uh, but we're also going to make sure to do a review of what an actual meeting looks like. Amy and I will be reviewing that with an upcoming core volunteer training on the 22nd of October. That's a Tuesday. All these times are 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Then that Thursday, October 24th, uh, Dr. Danny Richter and Adeline DeYoung will be joining us to look through the June meeting analysis, give you a little sneak peek about what we found this year in our meetings in June to be the most salient for members of Congress and how we're gonna be presenting them back in November. The legislative process and understanding Congress basics training is gonna be on Tuesday, October 29th. That's at 8 p.m. as well. And then lastly, we'll be joined by the wonderful Morgan McHugh and Sarah Wanis for a conference logistics Q&A. And that's specifically gonna be for some of the newer attendees. So if you are aware of other people in your chapter that are joining for the first time, that's really a needed webinar. If they have any questions, just to help them feel set up for success, they can ask anything they might be curious about and we'll go really in depth on some of the most basics, like even what to wear. So with that, uh, there's a little review for short link. All of these trainings are listed on our Preparing for Lobby Day page. So I'll put that in the chat window as well. And for those listening in later, uh, you can follow us simply by clicking on that link and you can see a little demonstration of what that page looks like in community. So our agenda tonight is really straightforward. We're gonna have a chance to have Don review the importance of the meeting lead. We'll have a chance to talk about advanced planning. We'll discuss some suggestions we have for setting up your meeting for success. Don's gonna model some transition examples. And then we'll have a chance to close with some final considerations. And with that, the floor is yours. I will make sure that we are all set up to go. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And we look forward to learning from you, Don. Awesome. Well, thank you, Brett. I really appreciate that introduction. And I appreciate everybody being on the call tonight and all those uh, who are going to listening to this afterwards. Um, I just want to start with a, a big thank you to you for, for being a leader uh, in this organization. You know, leadership is, is so essential for us, and we really can't function without it. Um, as all of you know, leadership can be very time consuming uh, and it definitely uh, requires you to push yourself outside of your comfort zone, which is uh, not an easy thing to do. So I really just can't thank you enough for being willing to do that, uh, to, to put yourselves out there and, uh, and really make CCL the, the amazing organization it is uh, because we can't do it without you. So let's jump into uh, kind of our, our advantage here when it comes to lobbying. Um, so a lot of us are going to feel nervous when you go into that first lobby meeting on the Hill. And I know for me, uh, I've, I'm coming up on nine years uh, doing this, going up on uh, to DC. And um, I still get nervous before I, I walk into some of these, these offices. And, you know, it's just an amazing experience being there on the Hill and in, in the most powerful legislative body in the world. And uh, so there's a, there's a reason that you can feel nervous. Uh, I do, and it's totally okay. But it's really also important to remember that, you know, we have the advantage here. We're the citizens, right? We're constituents. 
uh, we have the advantage because we're not professional lobbyists, but we are professional voters. And so that gives us a wonderful advantage. Our representatives want to hear from us. It's very different when uh, a member or a member of Congress or a staff member is hearing from a professional lobbyist as opposed to hearing from someone in the district. They always wanna hear from folks back home. That's who they are there for, that's who they wanna represent. And so the best thing we can say is really just relax, be yourself, and, uh, and don't worry, uh, you're gonna do great. So part of what makes CCL special is that we are volunteers. We're just ordinary people who care deeply about this issue. And it's important to remember that we are gonna make mistakes and folks in your group are gonna make mistakes and that's okay. Uh, in this training, we're gonna take some time to talk about how we can kind of make some transitions and uh, you know, how to keep kind of meetings on track. But ultimately, you know, we're there to build relationships. And so being human means that we get to build those relationships and being human also means we're gonna make mistakes because nobody's perfect and that's okay. So. With that, uh, I want to jump on to kind of leader, leading as a mentor. Uh, one of the things that's really important as a leader is we want to make sure that our meeting leads are well positioned to nurture and empower others, because that's what this is all about, right? We really want to make sure that our goal is to be empowering everybody that's in our, in our meeting. Uh, our meeting teams are, are the best. We are the, I think we are the best lobbyists in the world. And that's, that comes from the empowerment that we give others, uh, especially if you get folks in your meeting who maybe it's their first time on Capitol Hill. Maybe they just joined CCL and they're just kind of getting their feet under them. You know, that's a great opportunity for them to kind of step up and, and speak from their heart. You know, the best way to empower folks is to trust them, to have faith in them. You know, we've got to have trust and, and faith in the folks around us. And that doesn't mean that people aren't going to make mistakes because they are. Uh, we've got to allow space for people to succeed and space for people to fail. Because oftentimes, the only way uh, we, we end up succeeding is failing first. Uh, and that's kind of what makes our organization so cool, is we allow for freedom to fail. It's a part of the learning experience, right? Uh, it's like none of us uh, got up and started walking and walked perfectly immediately, right? We all, we all stumbled, we all fell. So, same thing here. We just want to be, we want to be nurturing to people. We want to be empowering to people because that's what, uh, that's what really makes us such a powerful organization. And so I want to transition a little bit to kind of advanced planning and what this looks like in terms of, you know, how do you kind of put your meeting together? What does this look like when you first get that information, when you first get to connect with your group and how does that kind of play out? Well, we'll start with just what is advanced planning? Well, advanced planning is what's gonna happen after you receive your lobby schedule. So your, uh, you will get your lobby schedule the week before a lobby day. Uh, so usually those go out uh, Thursday at five o'clock. And so I believe that the Thursday that we can expect those to go out will be November 7th uh, of, of next month. And so if you do not receive your, uh, if you do not receive your meeting schedule by uh, the end of the day on November 7th, you know, check your, uh, check your email, check your spam folder. Uh, and if you don't get it, definitely let us know. Uh, you can email schedules at citizensclimatelobby.org and we'll make sure we figure out uh, what happened. That's uh, schedules at citizensclimatelobby.org. So if you don't get that, um, if you don't get that, uh, that meeting schedule, there's, that's, your, that's your fallback. Uh, you can also always read at, reach out to your regional coordinator or your state coordinator too if that doesn't come through. So that's going to have your, your meeting on it and uh, you will be assigned, you, you will probably have a, a lead, you'll probably lead at least one meeting. Uh, so as the lead, we're, we're going to ask you to kind of take a little bit of extra, extra steps to help make sure our, our meetings go, go smoothly and are successful. So one of the first things uh, that's important to do is just kind of copy and pasting all of your meeting attendees cell number. That way you've got a, a, a group chat that's easy for people to communicate with. Uh, you can also call your team uh, at the, uh, that evening or the next day just to kind of connect and, and get coordinated. You'll also have everyone's email address so you can coordinate via email as well. 
It's also helpful if you set up a time for a conference call before you head to DC, just so everybody has an opportunity to connect. One thing that's really important is to make sure you call the congressional office and verify both the building and the room number. Most of the time, the building and room number are gonna be correct on your lobby schedule, but every once in a while, it's not. Uh, you know, if something happens, congr uh, Congress members do change uh, their offices. Um, it's, uh, that, that has happened to us before, and uh, then you end up, uh, uh, you kind of end up running around wondering where folks are or, or where the location is. So we really encourage you to just make that phone call. It's really easy, you know, less than a minute to just, just confirm that building and room number. So if you're the meeting lead, please, please do make that call. And then a couple other considerations for the leads. Um, if your plans change and you cannot attend a meeting or if you cannot lead the meeting, uh, definitely let us know. Let your regional coordinator know or let your state coordinator know. Usually it's not a, not, not a problem for us to find another lead for the meeting, but we won't do it if we don't know. So we, we really encourage y'all to, to just you know, give us a shout, let us know that uh, you know, if you can't make it or something's come up, no problem. It happens every year, we're used to it, uh, but, uh, but we do, we do wanna know. And then uh, the second thing is to just check your email and your texts a few times during the conference and right before the conference. Uh, sometimes things can change uh, at the last minute and we'll try and get a hold of you either by phone or by email. So just keep an eye out. And there are also some announcements that could come through or maybe something from a liaison or appointment setter or a regional coordinator. Um, and then, of course, our wonderful Amy Bennett, who, uh, who is the mastermind of, of all of our, our lobby schedules. So uh, really, just keep an eye out. You never know when, when stuff might change. So now you've gotten, to, you've gotten to DC, or you're about to head to DC. So one of the things you want to do is coordinate a time to meet with your team. As the meeting lead, that's, uh, that's going to fall to you, is to get that, uh, get that meeting time set. And uh, the planning is going to is really helps you set up for the meeting because it gives you an opportunity to learn what folks strengths are and what uh, kind of background they've got with CCL and what kind of relationships they have with that office. So use your plan as you know that's applicable to you and that really fits with your uh, with your goals in your meeting. So during the conference there'll be uh, meeting rooms set aside that will be available for lobby teams to practice to, to kind of get together. Um, on Sunday, uh, uh, Sunday, November 10th, uh, we'll have space available uh, in the chairman's room, the Calvert room, and the presidential boardroom from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So pretty much any time on Sunday. So if you're getting in a little early, uh, we, are, we will be doing uh, a showing of a, of a film screening on Sunday night, and then our conference will officially kick off Monday morning. So most folks will be trickling in through Sunday. So that's a great time to kind of get together because there's nothing that you have to be at uh, during Sunday and all of those times and spaces will be open. So it'll kind of be a first come first serve basis. Um, so if you get in there and maybe, you know, there are already a couple of groups meeting, you can always head over from like the chairman's to the presidential boardroom. And just a, just a quick reminder, of course, once you're done using the room, go ahead and put the, the chairs back and, uh, and make sure that everything is, um, you know, just leave it leave it nice, you know, simple manners. Y'all got this. Oh, uh, one of the other things that we want to make sure you're doing during this uh, advanced planning time is uh, finding a common time on Tuesday before your meeting uh, that you're going to meet after you've done your initial planning, right? So you're going to want to meet for your plan. And then Tuesday, you're going to want to meet beforehand, before you go into that office. Um, you don't want people just kind of showing up. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a little bit. Uh, one other thing is if you can't find the time, a time that works for everyone in your team, uh, you can set a time that works for most people and make your meeting plan there uh, with most of your attendees, with most of the folks who are going to be in that meeting, and then just fill in the one or two people who, who just can't make it. Um, given the amount of time we've got, uh, it, should, it should work out pretty well for most folks. But if that does happen, uh, you don't want to just abandon an advanced planning meeting because you know, one person can't make it. Go ahead and hold that, uh, hold that meeting anyway, and then fill the other person in. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Brett to talk a little bit about our Sunday schedule and the layout of the Omni Shoreham Hotel. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Don. So let's just walk through what to expect with Sunday. So Don highlighted the meeting room availability, and we'll just do a quick review of that first and foremost. So here's the Omni. You can see the main entrance is right here with this actual arrow. And for the full day on Sunday, you have your availability of all of these rooms over here, basically. We've got the embassy room, this little guy. We've got the chairman's room, that's even smaller. We've got Calvert, which you can see is actually listed in this corner. And then we have the presidential board room, and that's here. So if you go to the main entrance and then take a left down the east lobby hallway, you'll see some elevators. You'll take the left side of those elevators and then your first left down another hallway to access all of these rooms outside of the embassy room, which you can also access past those east elevators and just walk straight. The other events happening on Sunday, if you do get there a little bit early, is that we have registration opening up in the evening at 5 p.m. It also is open as well on Monday morning if you aren't due to arrive until then. And that's actually clipped off here, but the Ambassador Ballroom is on the west side of the main lobby. So you again would enter, and then as you enter through the main lobby and all those great nice scenic seats, you take a right, go down the west lobby pathway, take a right side past the west elevators, and from there you'll see a hallway with stairs down that'll spit you straight into the Ambassador Ballroom. And chances are right here towards the entrance of that, there'll be a table set up for you to register because at 7 p.m., Don mentioned there's a film screening on Sunday, and that's also where that will be housed at the Ambassador Ballroom. But the other thing I did wanna highlight based on what Don has been sharing is just the importance of also thinking ahead of time We've actually outlined on Monday a whole setup of planned times that we're suggesting if you have a meeting that meets or groups within a certain time period for your group to know that that's designated for that chunk of meetings. So chances are, especially since we're all gonna get really between two or three meetings, we're not gonna have a lot of overlapping time periods given that span. So you can see really what conference breaks are reserved for you and your lobby team by finding first on the left-hand side, the time your lobby meeting starts in that left column and then match it to the corresponding right column in that same row. So for example, say you have a 10.30 lobby meeting on Tuesday. So you would then look, oh look, 10.30 is within this time window. You would then see the first half of lunch is designated on Monday for those groups to meet up and so forth. We hope that that designation really helps make everyone's meeting planning experiences a bit smoother and easier to coordinate. And if you have any questions about that system, you know, feel free to reach out to Don or I. Uh, we're happy to steer you towards any other questions or clarifications. Uh, but with that, actually, I'll pass it back to you, Don. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. Uh, so let's, let's continue talking about the advanced planning. Oh, a little focus on coordinating your plans. Uh, so first, uh, before you can coordinate plans with uh, your folks, you've got to get to know them. You've got to introduce yourself, get connected. Uh, you can certainly send an email, or better yet, give them a call. Uh, it's really easy to be on email overload these days, so a phone call can work really, really well. If you don't know the volunteer, spend a few minutes just getting to know them. It'll help you determine what role they might fill and helps you develop trust with each other. Make sure you ask them uh, to kind of choose between what time options work best for their planning meeting. Possibly, you know, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Probably Sunday is going to be best. You can also utilize those times on Monday that Brett just, uh, just talked about. You can ask what roles they prefer to fill. If you're new to CCL, it might be a good time to review and explain the importance of each role for them. Also confirm that they receive their schedule, their bios, and their meeting plans if, if they're available and ask them to review that information before the planning session. Uh, if they haven't already, definitely recommend watching the planning your meeting with Congress uh, training ahead of arriving to DC. Uh, and that link will be made available to you. And uh, we can also create a, a subset of the groups if they are interested in ABLE. So in addition to that, uh, what, uh, what can you do in your planning session? Well, here are some suggestions for kind of an ideal situation. Well, we realize that a lot of us may be scrambling to kind of get ready. So any contact ahead of time is a good thing, even if it's just for you know, five or 10 minutes. But always try and read through the full meeting notes uh, because that's gonna give you a really great snapshot of where we are with this office. And since we've been lobbying on the Hill for almost a decade now, 
uh, there's definitely a lot of great material for some of these offices. So reading through that's gonna be really fantastic. And based on the last meeting, it's gonna give you a good idea of the types of questions you'll wanna ask for this meeting. If there is a meeting plan that has been submitted by the liaison, go ahead and review that meeting plan and discuss the meeting plan strategy or create one if there's not one that exists. You can review the concept of a supporting ask and when to use it. We use supporting asks when we have to kind of, when we've been turned down for our primary ask, because we always wanna create a situation where the member of Congress or the staff can tell us yes. We want as many yeses as possible. Sometimes that's not for the Energy Innovation Act, sometimes it's for one of our supporting asks. And we'll go through more of the supporting asks and what those will do uh, at the conference itself. And if it's uh, not already specified in the meeting plan, you can also help uh, the team settle on that supporting ask. As the lead, you'll want to facilitate the transitions, uh, uh, kind of transitions and with body language cues. You know, a verbal cue could sound like this. Uh, Ellie, would you tell me uh, why we're here today and what we're asking for? It's just kind of an opportunity to bring somebody else into the conversation. You're gonna also use body language as a cue. And sometimes that can just be as simple as like turning and looking at someone. During the planning meeting, let the team know how you plan to cue them. Or if you've practiced well enough, your, your team may not need cues at all. Do what feels right in the situation. Another thing to consider is that there are sample meeting outlines on community. If you have time to review them with your team, then go for it. And finally, during the planning meeting, uh, you'll want to assign roles. We've discussed roles in uh, great detail in the planning your lobby meeting training, but this is a really good time to, to lay out those roles so everybody knows what they're responsible for. It makes a really big difference. So let's talk more about those roles. Uh, as the meeting lead, you should encourage everyone to practice in the discussion and be flexible enough so that uh, the member of Congress or the staff is is clearly paying attention to one person in particular, you know, have that person speak more than others. After all, we're betting the ranch on relationships. So that's, that's a wonderful thing. Even though everyone is encouraged to speak when they have something to say, it's also important to have at least uh, six roles assigned so that we do not forget the basics. It's like those roles are really important. One of the most uh, important roles, and we're gonna go through all the roles here, and I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about the, the note taker in particular. Uh, but planning your lobby meeting uh, is really, this is really a great opportunity to, to get into those roles and make sure everyone has that assigned role. Uh, the roles include the appreciator, you know, who's gonna appreciate the, the member of Congress for the, their work for maybe a previous vote or you know, just meeting with us. Uh, the asker, this is the person who's gonna make the primary ask, which is gonna be supporting the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act, and the secondary ask. Uh, and if you've got more than one folk person, you can also have a primary ask and a secondary asker. And then the note taker. The note taker is one of the most important roles we have in CCL. The reason why we know where we are with all of these members of Congress and what the next step is with all of these members is because of our note takers. Uh, it's like our note takers are really important. They're gonna capture the important uh, topics within the meeting, what issues were covered. And the cool thing about November is we'll get to hear what all members of Congress were saying during our meetings in June. All of that information comes from that, those notes. So having somebody who's uh, willing to do those notes, get those notes in on time. And there's another cool thing that we're doing with the notes as well, is tracking how many open-ended questions we ask and how much time we're talking compared to how much time the staff or member of Congress is talking. So it's really giving us a, a, a third dimension in terms of how our meetings are really shaping out. So I, I really encourage, uh, you know, the note taker is a really, really important role. The time monitor is really, is really fantastic too. We, uh, we wanna make sure that we start the meeting on time, end on time, respect the member's time, respect the staffer's time, and the time monitor can also do the can also track the number of questions and the number the percent of time the member of Congress and CCLers were speaking, so that can go with a time monitor or the or the note taker. The lever is also important. We've got to leave behind any information that uh, that we may want to do, uh, that they may have asked us about, and we'll want to follow up. So having somebody who's willing to follow up, oftentimes this is the liaison, 
But especially in November, you'll probably be meeting with members of Congress and their liaison won't be there. So it's important to make sure that somebody is going to follow up oh, with that member or that staffer to answer any questions or just to follow up and say thank you. And remember, your role as a lead uh, will be to assess your team's interests and skills and work together in assigning coverage for each of these. So the, the pre-meeting huddle, this is, uh, this is great. So this is, we are, we're through, we've gotten through the conference, we're ready to go up on, uh, up on the hill. All right, so what do we do? Well, we really encourage y'all to meet outside of the member of Congress's office uh, before the meeting. And we encourage you to meet at that location between 15 and 20 minutes ahead of time. Now, I know that depending on where you're coming from, uh, from another meeting, and since it's November, we'll have fewer people in DC than we do in June. Uh, and so folks may have more meetings. Um, in June, you go, we, we usually get two meetings for folks. In November, sometimes that can be three or four meetings. So it might be that some folks run a little bit later, but we really encourage you to kind of hit that 15 minute sweet spot outside the meeting, uh, outside the member's office ahead of time. This is gonna give you an opportunity to go back through your roles uh, confirm, uh, assign, or reassign roles. Uh, it allows you to touch base about the goals of the meeting. Uh, again, confirm the primary ask and the supporting ask. And this is the best time to remind everyone to keep asking open-ended questions and reflect back to so that everybody's aware of kind of where the member of Congress stands. Uh, so those open-ended questions are really fantastic. Um, you know, we don't want yes or no questions. That makes it easy for a staff to kind of maybe duck and weave around us. Those open-ended questions are what we're after. You know, kind of think of uh, it's your, your high school English teacher, you know, and you, you forgot to read the assignments. You know you're not gonna get a yes or no answer or a yes or no question. You know, they're gonna say elaborate. So we wanna, we wanna get them on the same, the same page. So remind everyone to lis listen and look out for those cues that we talked about the day before. And a little later in the discussion, we'll talk about what to do if you have a constituent call into your meeting. Uh, the pre-meeting huddle is a good time to catch up with that constituent who will be joining by phone. Well, we don't have that often, we don't have that happen too often, but it is good to go ahead and uh, get that person ready to go uh, before the, the meeting starts. And uh, finally, we'll wanna walk in uh, to the office a few minutes early, but we really wanna wait outside until everybody shows up. If your meeting is, let's say at 10 o'clock, and it's you know, 9.57 and you're still missing uh, one of your members, that's okay, go ahead and go in because we do wanna start on time. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more now about what the meeting leader uh, actually does in the meeting. So the, the leader themselves uh, is kind of like a good conductor of an orchestra. You know, we're, we're going into these meetings to play some beautiful music. And the leader here, their goal is to manage the meeting, not dominate the meeting. And I'll say that again. The leader is there to manage the meeting, not to dominate the meeting. I think that's important because I know sometimes we, uh, we have a, a, a tendency to kind of, well, if we're the leader, you know, we're supposed to be talking all the time. And I know that I have fallen into this trap before. So just keep in mind that you're there to support everyone else's voice and help move the meeting forward, uh, not to, you know, kind of talk the entire time. So this uh, means that the leader is definitely going to kind of make sure that we're moving between speakers, that we're moving between roles, that we're getting the conversation back on track if it maybe goes askew, and also wrapping things up along with cueing people verbally and non-verbally as needed. And the, the leader also needs to make sure that the constituents and the liaisons are heard from. You know, we always wanna give a little bit of preference to our constituents and our liaisons because they're the ones who have the, the strongest relationship with the office, or more often than not, the constituents are the ones that the staff are gonna pay the closest attention to. The leader should also be able to understand the meeting situation and respond accordingly. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a minute, but we're gonna jump now into some transition examples. Uh, oftentimes in these meetings, you know, they're, they're unpredictable and we don't know where the conversation is gonna go, so oftentimes we kind of have to transition back to our original focus. And so I'm gonna go through a few examples of that right now. So we'll start with a kind of a beginning of the, the beginning of the closing. So before Brett and I kind of jump into demonstrating a couple of different examples, uh, there's something important to understand is that each meeting is different. 
So we really wanna make sure that we're proceeding in a way that is comfortable and appropriate for your situation. Being present and being a good listener are essential to determining what parts of the plan we wanna continue with, and even more important, what parts of the plan we're gonna just scrap. So I'll start off by demonstrating how you might transition from the discussion uh, to, uh, uh, to the end of the meeting at the close. So Congresswoman, I see that we are nearing the end of our time with you today. So I wanted to recap and clarify our understanding of the obstacles preventing you from supporting this proposal. Again, we're looking for actionable items out of this meeting. And as the meeting is coming to a close, we wanna make sure we're leaving with things that we can follow up with directly. So let's move on to a different transition. Here's an example of how we might transition from showing appreciation to stating our purpose. Congressman, I wanna thank you uh, for your recent efforts to protect citizens from identity theft. That's a really important issue for me. But today we've come to discuss how we can partner with your office to create the political will for a livable world. Now that works out really well, especially let's say you're meeting with a member of Congress that maybe doesn't have a stellar environmental record, but there are other things that they've done that you really do appreciate them for. You can start with that appreciation and then pivot back to the environment, pivot back to the climate. Let's look at another one. Uh, maybe it's our fourth meeting with this member of Congress or staffer. In that case, you may choose to skip the purpose and move from appreciation directly into the primary ask. Here's how that might sound if this is a Republican member of Congress we've established a really good relationship with. Congressman, I wanna thank you for your recent vote acknowledging climate change. We're here today to talk about solutions and to ask you to co-sponsor HR 763, which will place a steadily rising fee on carbon and return the revenue back to American households. Are you ready to support our proposal? Again, making that direct ask. Don't be afraid of the direct ask. The worst they can say is no, and that's okay. Let's take a look at another transition. Another way to verbally signal a transition is to state it explicitly. An example of that might sound like this. Congresswoman, I wanna thank you for your recent efforts to protect citizens from identity theft. That's a really important issue to me, but we're here to talk about a different topic. So Iona is going to let you know more about why we're here today and what we're seeking. So this is an example of where I was able to explicitly transition to Iona. And as a meeting lead, this is a great way to you, for you to cue somebody to, to kind of take on that next question. And again, you can prioritize constituents uh, and, and liaisons as well. Now, sometimes a meeting will get off track and you kind of go down a rabbit hole where we didn't really want to go. So there are a couple different ways we can do this. In the handling difficult situations uh, scenarios training, we review several examples of how to get meetings back on track. And I encourage everyone to review the handling difficult scenarios training. But we're gonna demonstrate one for you right now. In this example, the, Brett will play a member of Congress uh, or staffer who's kind of gotten off topic by discussing nuclear energy. And I'll play the leader who acknowledges his commitment and immediately circles back as to why we're at this meeting. Well, thanks so much, Don, but I really feel strongly that nuclear has to be part of the conversation and has to be on the table for me to consider any of these proposals. As an organization, though, we don't take a position on nuclear. We take a position on only one thing, reducing carbon emissions by placing a fee on greenhouse gas emissions and letting the market determine what's viable or not. The economists tell us that when we pass HR 7063, then the percentage of nuclear in our energy mix stays about the same as it is now. Would you like to hear more about the carbon fee and dividend as a viable economic solution to transitioning out of fossil fuels? So this is a good example of how the member of Congress is stating what's important to them, nuclear power. We come back and state how uh, HR 7663 maintains nuclear power across the United States and pivot back to the carbon fee and dividend as an economic solution. Well, let's talk a little bit now about situational awareness. Well, situational awareness is something that's really important for our meeting leads and for all of our folks who are kind of in, uh, in these meetings. Because while it's important to plan and having a plan is really helpful, sometimes our plans uh, kind of go awry or we can kind of end up on autopilot. So we'll go ahead and uh, we wanna practice ahead of time because you never know what scenarios might play out. Uh, that's why we always need to be focused on what is being said in the moment and respond to what we're actually hearing and not what we're expecting we're gonna hear or what we think we hear. 
as the meeting lead, you should recognize uh, when it might be appropriate to diverge from your plan. Uh, we refer to this as situational awareness. It's the ability to perceive and understand what's happening around you in the moment and be able to react to those challenges as they happen. Good situational awareness means uh, you're not only listening to the words being said, but also uh, the tone of voice and the body language too. And I've seen this in meetings with uh, body language of staffers or members of Congress that change based on the topic or who they're talking to. Sometimes it's for the better and sometimes it's for the worse. And moving on uh, from a topic that is kind of set up a bit of a body language wall, maybe something like crossing the and sitting across hands and sitting back, or something that's really positive, maybe a bit of a lean forward or uh, increased note taking. These are things that are, uh, really give you a cue that, all right, we're on the right track. One of the benefits of having a team is that uh, you don't pick up on a particular cue from a member of Congress or staffer, one of your team members very well might. And then they can ask that follow-up question or uh, redirect a derailed conversation. So let's talk a little bit now about empowering others. Another situation to look out for is the silent constituent. You may choose to encourage them to speak with a verbal cue such as, Brett, I uh, just like uh, to pause for a moment and see if there's anything you'd like to add at this point. Or what if somebody on the team uh, says something that is flat out wrong? Rather than correcting them, try saying something like this. If I may, let me add to what Brett was saying. Your team will appreciate you for not correcting them or pointing out what they forgot. Uh, what you could do if a CCL volunteer gets uh, agitated or angry during a meeting. That doesn't happen often. In fact, it's really rare, but it does happen. So just be prepared for it and stay calm. Here's how it could play out. Brett will play an angry volunteer and I will play the team leader. Yeah, I just wanted to start by saying it's you, Congress, who are stalling and making this worse. Congresswoman, obviously we're very passionate people and we've been working very hard to try and get something done on time. Uh, you were just saying uh, how you don't think uh, that remaining in the Paris Climate Agreement would be effective. Could we share with you what we've learned about the effectiveness of H.R. 763, the Energy Innovation Act? So that is a, that's a really good example. You can definitely tell like sometimes folks do get frustrated, which makes sense. I know I have been in meetings uh, where staffers have made me frustrated. I've also been in meetings where staffers have told me things that I know are just not true. And so, you know, as just like with our volunteers, we don't want to point those out and say, that's just wrong. We want to say, you know, can, can I add something to that and just kind of move the conversation forward? Again, here, we're not pointing to Brett and saying, Brett, that was terrible. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. We're just shifting the conversation, you know, pointing out our passion for this topic, remembering that we are constituents and human beings, and that here's an opportunity for us to have a conversation about the impacts and effectiveness of the legislation we're advancing. So let's uh, talk about some other considerations. The size of your team will vary from meeting to meeting. If there are just two or three volunteers in a meeting, then each person will need to fill more than one role. However, as we've been growing so rapidly throughout the country, it's more likely that you're gonna be in a, a lobby meeting with a larger group of people. Large groups may, uh, uh, may mean that some folks don't really have a lot to say or don't have a lot of time to speak. So as the leader, you want to acknowledge and appreciate them for that. Having additional people in a meeting whose role is looking pleasant and affirming their interest is important. So even if they don't say anything, we should value them as being present and a participant. Also, you may run into the situation where someone informs you that they're going to be late. Coming in late will disrupt the meeting. The only time you want to let a volunteer join a meeting already in progress is if they're the only constituent. Otherwise, politely thank them for letting you know and explain to them that coming in late will disturb the meeting and that you will fill them in afterwards. So just to recap on that, because this is a really important point. Uh, if you are the only constituent in the meeting and you're running late from another meeting, then you, you can go ahead and join the meeting because we do want you in there if you're the only constituent. However, if there's another constituent from your district in there, or if you are not a constituent in that district and you're running late, we definitely encourage you to just hang outside, catch up with folks afterwards, and take that time to prepare for the next meeting. Uh, it's really disruptive to enter those meetings late, uh, and it also shows a, 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 the fact that we don't show up late 
really shows the professionalism of our volunteers. So we really encourage you to, to just be aware of that. The final situation to review for DC meetings is when a volunteer from another region or state shows up from a meeting they're not scheduled in. First of all, make sure they're not in the wrong place or ditching a meeting that they should be in. Given how much time and coordination has been put into the lobby scheduling process and that others may have wanted uh, to join and were not able due to their lobby day filling up earlier than usual this year, we ask you to thank them for their interest and passion let them know that we're, we've got plenty already and that the scheduling process was set up to structure each meeting fairly and we don't want to overwhelm the office. So now we've had a fantastic meeting. We've got a lot of follow-up to do. So now we've got to debrief and figure out what the next steps are. So in most situations, you're going to have time uh, between meetings to debrief. Uh, uh, sometimes you'll have to run off to another meeting right away. But most of the time, it makes a lot of sense to move away from the members of Congress's office and hang out in a hallway to talk through the meeting. Uh, you do wanna just be cognizant that you're not right outside the door. Uh, it's not great to be talking about a meeting that you just had when the staffers can hear what you're saying. So uh, you wanna just kinda of move, move off a little bit, uh, congregate and kinda of go through the meeting notes. A really good debrief is just kind of a short examination of the meeting. And here's what a debrief could look like. Uh, first of all, um, we, want, we want the meeting lead to begin talking about uh, what went well and the, what opportunities there are to kind of nurture the team members. We want to make sure that we go through the notes, that the note taker captured everything that we felt was important, and that everybody in the meeting has an opportunity to make sure that what they thought was a big takeaway from the meeting is captured in that notes, because you really want consensus on those notes. We all look back at the minutes uh, and make sure that we've titled everything correctly and uh, really show you know, that we've, we've gotten the important things captured. And if there's something missing, go ahead and capture it. And anyone interested in debriefing the meeting afterwards can look for the CCL staff, like can look for any CCL staff like Dr. Danny Richter or Brett or myself, and uh, we'll be on the Senate side in the morning and the House side in the afternoon. So if you had a really fun meeting or a really interesting meeting, and, uh, and you're just really excited and you want to share it with staff, um, come find us. Uh, we'll be in uh, the Dirksen and, and in the cafeterias in, in Dirksen and Hart in the morning and the Rayburn cafeteria in, in the afternoon. So uh, there'll definitely be folks around. Um, some of us will, will be attending meetings with y'all, uh, but uh, there'll also be uh, members, our staff members in those, uh, in those locations throughout the day. So let's take a look at our meeting minutes form. Now, our meeting minutes form is pretty self-explanatory, but there are a couple of things worth mentioning. Notice that there's an area for you to enter the meeting number. This meeting number is on your schedule. Uh, as Brett will show you in just uh, two more slides, uh, it's a really cool thing. When you submit your meeting notes, include your meeting number, and every person in the meeting will receive an email with those notes, so everyone gets a copy of it. So, how do you get your meeting number from your lobby schedule? It's the five digit number in the black box in the top right corner of the meeting schedule. Then everybody will have that, have that schedule. So keep in mind that these meeting notes are confidential. They are not to be shared. So if you utilize that meeting number, everybody in the meeting will get a copy of those notes, but they are not for sharing. So think of the, the trust that would be ruined if our meeting minutes got out there. You know, one of the things is we talk about really sensitive things, especially with members of Congress who are in maybe tough elections or you know, have a constituency that may be really concerned that you know, they're even talking with somebody who's concerned about climate. So the fact uh, that we keep these meeting minutes confidential is what allows the staff to be candid with us. And it means we have better meetings and are have, a, have a better insight into what's going on in each office because they trust us. And so we want to make sure that we're maintaining and are worthy of that trust. So you'll need to submit an electronic copy of your notes within 48 hours. And you can do that by going to citizensclimatelobby.org backslash minutes. As the team leader or your lobby lead, uh, you'll want to make a, a, a kind of a separate save note for the note taker's full name in case we need to locate unsubmitted notes. These meeting minutes are important documents, let's build momentum. And so your attention to detail and your follow through and getting them submitted 
uh, will really be success is really a, a marker of success for your team and for the next team. And if you don't submit them, then Amy Bennett is going to come after you. And I promise you that's not what you want because she is relentlessly respectful. All right. So one more thing I want to talk about is uh, positions on climate and the act. So as being leads, let's quickly uh, talk about one last position statement. During the debrief, you're going to want to, uh, to make sure uh, to capture as accurate a window as possible into the member's position on both the Energy Innovation Act as well as their individual beliefs on climate change. To track this over time, CCL has developed a four-letter scale from A to E, with grades further down the alphabet actually indicating more favorable positions. So it's better to get a D than an A. In order to make your best, most accurate estimate, we hope the, that during the meeting you're able to get clarity on both of these positions during your primary ask for the Energy Innovation Act and making climate change a bridge and not a wedge issue, as well as the overall conversation regarding their position. So for the Energy Innovation Act, an A would not vote for it. A B is somebody who may or may not vote for it. A C would definitely vote for it. And a D would absolutely vote for it and would co-sponsor it. And an E is someone who has already co-sponsored the act. And then for a climate position, our A are our climate denials. Fewer and fewer of those these days. Our Bs are the climate is changing, but maybe there's not really a human contribution. C is the climate is changing and humans are contributing. And D, the climate is changing, humans are contributing, and Congress needs to do something about it. I want to talk a little bit about to be determined meetings, TBD meetings. So you may get a schedule that has a TBD meeting on it. So this means to be determined. The meeting is not yet set. Now we really try as hard as we can to get as many uh, meetings set before these meeting notes or these schedules go out to you. Uh, however, um, while we, in an effort to get you the information as soon as possible, we really try and get it to you, uh, on that Thursday. That means that really Thursday evening, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, meetings are going to keep getting scheduled and keep coming in. So that means you're going to get a to be determined that could get set after that time. Now, if we send out this piece of paper to you and you print it on Thursday, and then on Friday, we get that meeting schedule in and we update our system, you're holding a piece of paper. So even though our system is correct, it's not going to show up on your piece of paper because obviously your paper is not digital. So we will need to contact you to let you know that this is what's going to happen. So uh, this may come from the appointment setter or directly from Amy, or it can also come from your, uh, uh, from your regional coordinator. And uh, we're really trying to get our regional coordinators to, to kind of take this on as well. So hopefully you're going to get information from somebody that you know. But just be aware, if you've got a TBD, we talked earlier about, you know, keeping an eye on your phone, keeping an eye on your emails, on your text messages. Um, we really do try and make calls and texts when a to be determined gets set. So we, we let you know. But uh, we, we often, that, that, that can't happen. So just be aware of it. The, uh, we also want to try and avoid uh, a two o'clock Eastern time as that's the most common hour we've booked for meetings. And so that might make it so that no one's available to sign up when it's been assigned. The to be determined meetings are also intentionally overfilled because we know when that meeting is finally scheduled, some people will have conflicts. Your to be determined meetings are usually your teams that are going to be smaller, uh, maybe two, three, four folks, uh, because other people will have those conflicts. So the remaining schedule for the rest of the team is displayed in the far left columns of the schedule. So you'll know whether or not someone can attend a TB determined to be determined meeting once it's confirmed. So if let's say you've got a, a schedule and you know everybody has uh, down the line, everybody's got a 10 a.m. meeting. Uh, and then this meeting comes in and let's say it's 11 o'clock, but two people also have an 11 o'clock meeting. Okay, well, you know the other three or other four will have that availability. So, uh, so that that's just gives you a little bit of, an, uh, of a heads up. That way, once it gets set, you, uh, you can let everybody know. So once the meeting is confirmed, uh, as the leader, you will need to inform your teammates by phone, email, and text to let them know. And all three are important. Uh, there's a lot going on, especially during the conference. 
Uh, so if that does get set, please you know, go down the list, call them, email them, text them, let them know. Why all three? Well, you can't depend on having good cell service in DC. Some folks don't text and some folks hate email. So we gotta meet them where they are, right? And it's like all three, that's how we do it. If you are contacted by the team lead of a to be determined meeting, please respond as soon as possible. So if you get a text saying, you know, this is, uh, this is Jill and we're good to go for uh, Senator Smith, I'll say, okay, great, I'll be there at 11. Or, I'm sorry, I can't, I've got a conflict at 11. Just let them know as soon as you can. All right, so let's, uh, let's run through the delivery only meetings real quick. Uh, delivery only is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, this is somewhere where we're going to just drop off a, uh, uh, a set of, uh, and we're just going to drop off information at the office. We don't expect to have a, a, an actual meeting. So basically, we're dropping off constituent letters and a primary ask. Delivery onlys are different than a to be determined. With a to be determined, we anticipate uh, you know, that that may actually be set. A delivery only will not be set. It's usually going to be two people, and they're going to go, uh, go right for it. So uh, the last thing I'm gonna do is just throw this over to Brett for the constituent call-in. Hey, thanks so much. Here is the big update on constituents calling in, and that is this. So with all of our meetings, there's always the possibility that even if somebody isn't in DC, they might have the chance to join us with a phone call to really bring that voice of the constituent to the meeting. So when you receive your schedule, you might actually notice that there's a meeting that's indicated with a constituent call-in on that form that Don just walked through as well. Uh, the leader should basically conference that constituent in then during the meeting into the meeting by the phone that they have. Uh, and so really to plan that ahead of time, as soon as you can, reach out to that constituent. Their numbers are gonna be available on that meeting plan form to both confirm their availability as well as really just walk through what role they wanna play. Uh, you also wanna make sure if they're not in Eastern time zone to remind them when the meeting's taking place, that's happened a lot. If they're calling in a Pacific time zone or you know, let's say Montana, uh, they need to make sure to adjust that time to make sure that they're actually gonna be on time for the meeting. And then when the meeting actual time starts, confirm with the office just ahead of time that it's gonna be okay for the constituent to join them by phone, explain what you're doing with your phone, it's a lot easier to use your cell phone than to try to use the member of Congress's number or landline uh, to the office. That can be a lot harder to coordinate unless they insist that that's the way that they prefer. And then just place the call on speaker. Uh, and then throughout the meeting, the key thing to consider is involving that constituent as you find it appropriate. You can pause or cue them, especially if you've ahead of time arranged for them to take on a role that you wanna make sure to highlight throughout the meeting. Uh, and it's gonna be hard for them to jump in on the phone sometimes without those cues. And the other thing just to notice uh, is that cell service on Capitol Hill is spotty sometimes. So if you can't have them join, if you've tried and you've practiced everything set up and then for some reason you drop the call or they're hard to hear, just keep rolling on. Don't get flustered, that's an important addition, but you don't have to have that to be central to your meeting. And a little quick reminder too, uh, speaking of constituents calling in, we're actually gonna be doing our constituent call-in day the Wednesday ahead of our meetings on the Hill. So Wednesday, November 6th, we're, CCL is asking all of our supporters to call their legislators to help amplify our voice, move Congress closer to support, and even if they can't join us in DC, demonstrate that there is that political will back home and district. So as a reminder of that, or as a help to get that coordinated in your interest, I'll put a link to that information in the chat as well. Uh, but with that, it's the top of the hour, and we have covered a compendium of information. Thank you again so very much for listening in tonight. Thank you, Don, for a wonderful webinar. If you have any questions, here's a link featured to CCL Communities Forums, where we'd love for you to search what's already been asked and pose any questions that you'd like more clarity on. Don and I's emails are also provided here. That's simply just Brett at citizensclimate.org or Dawn at citizensclimate.org as well. We also have featured the FAQs page for the November Lobby Day registration. And if you are curious about the actual schedule and live time events, we have an app for that. 
The Grenadine app is available on any of the stores that you might use for your iPhone or Droid. Just search for Grenadine and download it. And then when you've downloaded it, enter the code for our event this fall. It's 2019 NLD for November Lobby Day. 2019 NLD in all caps. So with that, we hope that you found this training empowering and we look forward to seeing you in DC in just one month. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.